So today, a uh, little bit talking about uh, feeding gophers to uh, Chidra. It's uh, safe to say that uh, I'll be digging into both in this case. So a small table of contents along with some live demos today. Uh, first of all, who am I? Uh, then I want to talk a bit about Java. I see some people already laughing here. It's a bit of a running joke with me. Uh, as a, I have a preference for it, but more on that later. And then I want to show you around a little bit in Jira for those who either uh, haven't used it before or kind of unaware what it is. Maybe have only seen it from afar. Uh, then I want to talk a bit about languages and difficulties. And in this case, I mean the target language. Uh, so if you have a binary that's written in C++, you might have certain difficulties. And similarly for Golang, uh, which is what we're going to be addressing today. Um, I have a, a live demo of the script at the end. Prior to that, I'll go over to some of the more Golang internals and um, how the scripts work, what kind of approach there is. And there's Q&A at the end. Uh, if either we run out of time or there's no time for the additional questions, if you see me around today, feel free to ask and I'll be happy to answer. Now, a brief slide about myself. Uh, my name is Max Kerst. I go by the nickname of Libra and I'm a malware analyst and reverse engineer for Trellix. Uh, within the advanced research center. So we get to do all kinds of cool research in a variety of topics, really. Uh, so one of the things that I worked on is dot dumper, automatic unpacker for .NET malware, uh, which we open sourced uh, for both corporate and my personal website. I tend to write blogs about reverse engineering and whatever I do, I try to make that as open source as possible. And in the past, I've worked a bit on some Android related things. Now, I don't just want to talk about me, also about the, the golfers. Um, it's the official Golang mascot created by uh, René French, if I pronounce that correctly, I'm not sure. Uh, but rest assured, there were no golfers harmed during this research, uh, even though I'm feeding them to Jira. So a slight bit about Jira itself. It's a software reverse engineering framework, as the NSA describes it. And they are the ones who have created this platform uh, based on the source code. The earliest dates roughly that were found were in 1999. Uh, so it's been in development for quite a while, but it was open source to the public and declassified in 2019. Uh, yeah, in 2019, in March, uh, I think they released it at the RSA conference. And then a few months later, they actually gave the source code instead of the pre-compiled version, which put a lot of minds at rest as to how trustable the pre-compiled uh, version was. I haven't read anything about it that they did tamper with it, but given the nature of the beast, um, I'll leave that up for you to decide. So a little bit about Java itself. Uh, it's Jira's native tongue. So roughly put cutting some corners here, uh, there are two languages uh, in which Jira has been written, uh, which is Java for the main framework, the graphical user interface you're dealing with. And they have one major part in C++, which is the decompiler. They have some additional parts as well uh, with regard to the Slay uh, framework that they have to translate any given architecture into P code. And that will help you to reuse components within the framework without implementing them again and again for the same language. Slightly more on that later. Now, for those who are in favor of Python, which is I think the big majority of the uh, community in InfoSec. Uh, there's a Jiten uh, support, so you can write your uh, scripts in Python 2, but Python 2 is not necessarily, uh, well, the most up-to-date version, so to say. And there are some Python 3 bridges uh, which you can use. Uh, granted, they do require the installation of a third-party plugin and you're, well, semi-dependent on that one, keeping uh, support. Now, as I said before, it's not really the favorite, most favorite language when talking about Java. It is for me. Uh, so the scripts that we have uh, for the Golang analysis are written in Java. And both the, the Java and Python 2 scripts can be debugged in Eclipse. Uh, and for that, you use the Jira dev plugin that was provided by the NSA. Now, with regards to understanding Jira, I just want to give a live demo as to what it is and what does it look like. I think a live demo is a lot better than me going over dozens of screenshots to show you things and explaining them uh, and should make it more interactive. So Jira is uh, opposed to many of the uh, programs. Now I need to make sure that you guys actually see 
what I'm seeing rather than there we go this is what I was seeing otherwise it gets a very fr <laughs> weird presentation so uh, unlike many tools G drive is project based uh, where you can run your project locally or on a remote server and if you do that on a remote server that allows easy collaboration because if you have let's say a colleague in a different time zone let's say US West Coast compared to here is generally nine hours difference uh, so that's most of your work day uh, so by the time I'm closing down and I've done some reversing on a project I can just save my progress and then when my colleagues wakes up in a different time zone uh, they can open up pull the latest changes and just continue um, the way I would normally uh, so collaboration gets easier you don't have to share additional database files as you would with other programs uh, but it, it does require you to have a slightly different mindset. So it's not you open Jira and thereby open a program, but you start a project. In this case, I have a local one. You import files, and then once you've imported those, you can start the analysis. Now, I tend to give them quite long names, uh, which helps me, but might be uh, confusing. And in here, I have a, a sample, uh, which is a Linux-based ransomware. And we can see that once we open the sample itself within the code browser, as the uh, tool is named, so GDRAC consists of multiple tools. Uh, and in here we have uh, quite some views. So we have a disassembly and we have a decompiled view. We have the program tree itself with all of the sections. We have a symbol tree where we can also search for the symbols, but we can also look for what are the exports or what are the functions. And those are grouped in a tree. Now, you have your data type manager as well. Your data types are where you either make custom structures, unions, classes, um, anything that you would like to use. Uh, you can save those in a custom library. So you see here, for those who don't need classes or are wearing the appropriate ones, uh, it says Libra, Libra library. Um, and so I made my own library in here where I save my custom uh, structures. So, for example, I did some reversing on the Hermetic Wiper last year, and it traverses through your file system. But the file system structures weren't present originally within Jira. So it spent me about two days and nights making them. And then I figured I would rather reuse them later on than spending, an, again, the same time on this. Uh, so I st stored those differently. And then you have different packages. So this is uh, Windows Visual Studio 1264-bit, which has been part of Jira uh, once you download it essentially and you have built-in types so these are your standard types let's say uh, integers floats uh, those kind of things and lastly you have a library that is purely here for this sample so if I make a custom structure I can specify where do I want to save it um, and I can just say oh well I want this one in my own library uh, but maybe I just want it for this sample Let's say it's a, it's a config structure for this specific sample and version. I don't really require a reuse of this later on. And if you were to export your analysis, you get a Jira zip file, which includes your changes along with the original binary, which you can then import in any other Jira version, which is either of the same version or later, should be backwards compatible. But if you are running the newest and somebody tries to open it in an older version, you might not be that lucky. Um, but for example, the Libra library one is not exported because it's an external library that I created myself. So I would need to pass that to somebody as well if they do want those types. Uh, you can not give it if it's propriety or you don't trust the person or don't want to share it for any other reason. Uh, you will get an error and those types will simply be missing. So you can still use it. It's just not optimal. Now we see quite some icons on the top as well. Uh, not all of them are equally relevant to day-to-day -day use. And it also depends on what you do as a day-to-day -day job. So my job is to analyze malware. If you're here to check that firmware has no backdoor, you will probably have, well, at least a slightly different use case than I have, or if you're hunting for vulnerabilities. So what we can see here, if we go to the window view, we can see some of the icons again, uh, just on the left. But what we're very interested in today is the script manager. And the output of scripts will be in the console at the bottom. So the console itself is read-only, uh, as in I'm not able to type something here. It's not interactive that way. But uh, it does allow you, let's say, if there is a address uh, formatted in hexadecimal format, I can just double-click that, and it will jump 
uh, to that. So these components are linked. Now, you're not bound to having only one window of each. I could make the whole screen fill up with different decompile windows. Wouldn't be very useful, but I could. Um, and by default, the disassembly and the decompile view are linked. So if I were to select this part of code, it will also show me what the equivalent in decompiled function is. Now, obviously, the decompiler does some magic, but also some guessing. It might be incorrect, uh, where usually your ground truth is located in the disassembly. But especially if you're using a different architecture that you haven't done anything with before, uh, you might be able to recognize some patterns within the uh, pseudo C that you see on the right hand side. And therefore, uh, just select, let's say, a loop, an if statement, or just assigning uh, some values, and you might see which of the assembly instructions correspond with this. Now, I briefly spoke about the fact that you can use Judah for a lot of different architectures, and that's because the fact that your architecture is ported or lifted to P code, and we can enable uh, P code to show it. And what we now see is that underneath each instruction, uh, we can see, for example, for the move instruction, we can see that there is a copy command and a store command. Uh, so we can see in generic terms what each instruction does, including setting of specific flags if need be. Now, this is what they call uh, P code or low P code. You can also have high P code to, well, not get confused. And high P code is what your decompiler uses. So for normal P code, you see exactly what each instruction does, but you're not really able to traverse uh, through the through the the data that you have. Let's say I have one function that is responsible for decrypting a string, and you pass a hard coded string in there within the binary. Now, what I would like to do is script this to automate it, and I would like to be able to simply say, okay, Judah, for each of those functions, whenever it's called, I want to get the value that is passed to it, and I want to get that value within my script. Then I just recreate the decry decryption or do that via emulation or anything you like. And then I know what the value is. After which you can either patch that value just so you can see it or you can add comments, bookmarks, anything that you would like to do. Now, the traversing here is what requires you to remove the or go from normal P code to high P code. And therefore, um, var nodes are created. Uh, I'm not going to go into this any deeper. But with those var nodes, you can traverse uh, backwards. So you know that a variable was used, what value it was assigned, if it was changed in the meantime. Um, and that allows you to more easily work with this. Now, why the whole explanation about P-code if we're actually talking about Golang? Uh, because I knew P-code existed, but there are some limitations that are, I'm not going to dive into it here now, uh, that are restricting you to do certain things. So ideally, you want the script to work for any architecture uh, and any bitness, uh, really, so that you can just use a script like, oh, it's Golang, I have these scripts. Some of the scripts are based on patterns where some of them are generic and work across. So that is a bit of a backstory there. So I'm just going to uh, disable this field. So I, uh, and you can do more here, obviously. So it's pretty customizable. But moving back to the scripts, uh, we have some scripts here. And uh, what we can do is we can run them on this binary because it's Golang based, but I'll teach you with that and only return there a bit later. This is not the screen that I need, but this one is. So th that's just to give a bit of an understanding as to what is Jira, how do you use it? Uh, but then there are some different languages, like I said before, and you have certain difficulties there as well. So... Uh, your approach to a given binary is likely to differ based on the architecture. And that already starts by having, let's say, a ARM binary on my Intel-based machine. Uh, if I just want to debug that on the side, either with GDRAS debugger, which I'm not touching on in this talk, but uh, or any other debugger, I would either need emulation or I need a different device where I can do the debugging on. Whereas in this case, um, you can just do it if it's Intel-based. Now, the sample was Intel-based. Nice. Um, but you can see uh, that there are different concepts that are overlapping within different languages. If we're talking about Java and C Sharp, they're both virtual machine based. Now, that doesn't mean to say that they're exactly the same, but some of the approaches you have or ideas you have might be reused within. 
Sadly, there's no magic catch-all solution for this where you just one click and have a full analysis because otherwise I wouldn't be standing here but either be jobless or swimming in money, depending if I was the one who made it. Um, and some of the language have cro uh, cross-platform capabilities. Now you have C, for example, which uh, is very known for this, uh, but Golang has this as well. So you can write it once and run it in several places, if you will. Uh, but it's kind of a double-edged sword where it's easy to use for developers because it doesn't matter if your customer or client is using uh, a Linux distribution, Windows, Mac OS, or anything else that runs Golang. Uh, but it is also uh, really usable because once you figure out those concepts, you don't care anymore what kind of platform it's running on because most of your work can be reused as well if set up properly. So a bit about Golang itself. Um, the runtime is embedded in the binary, which also makes it rather big. Uh, you have a very small binary if you just write plain C. If you write it in Golang, we'll have a lot more issues if you want to keep the size small. So this also gives us the downside when we're analyzing Golang, part of a library, or is it not? Because once you really dig into a function and it kind of looks library-ish, you might be opted to skip it instead and either gamble what it does or hope that you figure out later. Uh, I'm not the only one, and certainly it's not the last time that I'm digging into a function only to realize halfway through that it's a string compare function, for example. And if I would know that string compare, I wouldn't dig into it because it saves me time and already know what it does. And in the end, you want to be as fast as possible regardless of your specific job. Now, the compilers allow you to either strip a binary or not strip it. So a uh, strip binary doesn't contain symbols anymore. And those symbols are pretty useful in the case of analyzing a program that you don't have the source of. If the function is to reverse files and encrypt everything I encounter, it's pretty straightforward. It might not be the best naming scheme, but it at least tell you what, tells you what it does. Compared to function 7, it doesn't really tell me it's going to encrypt my files and, and do anything specific. So then I would have to figure out what does this do, and that costs me time. So if I can have those symbols by default, that would be great. Now, there's a lot of help already within Jira. Uh, I already showed you the data type archives, and we had one from Visual Studio. So all of these string compare and similar functions should be recognized given that they match the function signature. And then they have packages like this for different versions of the uh, Microsoft runtimes and uh, differences as well. Uh, I think there is a individual who released several uh, of these libraries based on Linux source code and uh, dependencies thereof. And uh, I think there is a post from Kaspersky for, uh, that contains libraries for Microsoft Visual Studio 2013. Um, so you can gather some, you can make some, uh, which should help your analysis in the long term. So it's an investment now for later. But for Golang, there's this very magic trick where you can tell the compiler to strip your binary, and it does, but it also doesn't. And this is really helpful for us because we essentially have symbols. We just need to find a way to connect them uh, so that our analysis program actually knows which function has which name. But not only function names, you also have symbols that you can use and reuse. So as I said, for Golang, it's difficult to see what's runtime related and what's not because the binary might be really small. So there was the, the Swift slicer uh, wiper that was used on Ukrainian targets at the end of February. And I think in total, there are like seven user defined functions, uh, but there are a lot more functions in that binary. So if you're going to reverse everything, then uh, you're going to have a bad time. But if you find out exactly what you need, then you are only busy for a short period of time. If you recover the original function names, that should be even shorter because it's, oh, I don't want to say reading source code, but uh, for a simple program like this, it gets close to it in terms of understanding. But I see a lot of people approach this as like, well, I see this assembly and it's, therefore, I can approach it like any C-like library uh, or binary. And you could do this. And I've seen some people just approach it in a debugger, writing down what happens and go afterwards uh, to simulate what happens and thereby restructuring the source code. Uh, 
but that feels like a very lengthy process for bigger binaries. And it begs the question, is it worth it to invest that much time into a single binary? It might in specific cases, but if I'm investing this much time in any file that I uh, get or want to investigate, uh, I would not get my hands on many samples. But as a malware analyst, I'm interested in, well, mainly three things from, from binaries. I'm interested in strings, I'm interested in functions, and I'm interested in types. So strings, they give me information, especially if they're not encrypted. Uh, functions, because if I don't have to investigate exactly what the function does, it makes my life a whole lot easier. And types, because maybe sometimes I just see an offset to a specific address. But if I know that that offset is a password for a decryption that is used later on, uh, it's much easier to understand what's going on rather than seeing <laughs> EBX plus 20 hacks, which is okay, cool, but what's going on here? So a small note about strings in Golang is during compilation, they're all packed together. So they become this huge string and they are not zero terminated anymore as you normally would expect. Instead, uh, during runtime, uh, the big string, uh, as I like to call it, um, you the address, you take the offset, and then you take a length. So if I were to concatenate all names of everybody in the audience, and then my name would be somewhere in the middle, I could say, well, uh, at the start plus offset 20, um, then for the length of three, I want to get those characters as a string, and that's done during runtime. So if you look by default in, well, I don't necessarily want to say any decompiler, but at least in GDRAS, uh, you can see often that a uh, direct reference to a string is like this huge string, uh, or it's so big that the decompiler just references it as an address where it's like, well, I'm not going to show you this because it's like two pages, uh, just word of strings. And then it's essentially up to you as to what does this do uh, versus I have the exact string. Now, that's something we're going to tackle later on as well. So the analysis scripts... Uh, are based on the public work of uh, Dorka Palote. She works for Cujo, and she wrote the original versions of these scripts in Python 2. Uh, I met her at BotConf last year, and we collaborated on this, and I spent, uh, well, more time than I'm willing to admit on refining these scripts, documenting them, uh, and making it work. Uh, and I don't want to claim that this is the first project to use these concepts or similar ones. There are various projects out there that do this, just not for Jira. And I kind of enjoyed the tool, figured it was a nice learning experience and it would help combat the Golang binaries I encounter. So I saw that as a win all around, but I do want to uh, thank her profusely for the work. Now, the approach here is that we have essentially four different scripts. We have static string recovery, dynamic string recovery. We have function name recovery where the uh, discovery is renaming functions that Jira has already recognized, just doesn't know the name for, um, and the recovery because Jira misses functions as well. So there are a lot of new functions created. And we have type recovery where we know the type that we're dealing with and we know the fields of the struct, which is time-saving, to say the least. Now, in general, uh, the static string recovery uh, is... Iterating over two segments of data within the binary, uh, you could do this over all segments, but they're only located in these sections, and thereby it's a lot faster if you just take these two. We perform some sanity checks to make sure that the instructions we're looking for actually make sense and result in a string as output and not garbage. Uh, because we're creating data structures within JIRA automatically, we don't want to ruin your analysis by creating false ones or uh, creating errors, and then we create, create the string and pointers to it, uh, which then tells the decompiler as well as the disassembly to treat it as a string or a string pointer, um, which then helps you once you do the analysis. Now, for dynamic string recovery, uh, we do this on a pattern matching. So this is on a per-architecture basis. Um, top of my head, there is 32-bit and 64-bit Intel and... 32-bit and 64-bit ARM included. If you have a more niche architecture, then um, the scripts are going to be public. Good luck. Uh, or message me and maybe we find a way uh, to do this. So overall, we just parse the instructions. We get the operand values. And based on that, we well, add some more logic and sanity checks. And then again, we create the string and pointers towards it. 
As for the function name recovery, we are looking for the PCLN tab. And even though Golang is cross-platform, uh, uh, there are differences here and also differences in which version of Go you're using. So um, it's very nice that the language kind of keeps a change log as to what has changed and you can look into this, which helps. I see a question, but is it relevant now or you want to ask it afterwards? I'm fine with either. So the looking uh, the the part for the PCLN tab uh, it stands for program counter uh, line tab, which corresponds your compile binary and it keeps track of the uh, line of your source code, but it also contains the function name. So we have the original function name that was present in the original source code, and we can parse that out from the PCLN tab, and then based on that, what we can do is we can rename that function at the location where we found it. So we have to offset within the binary, we have the new name, we simply rename it, remove some illegal characters because I'm not sure what they're named. Uh, in Java, there are packages. Uh, and so in, in Golang, you have like the, the dots or slashes in between. We just make sure that there are no illegal characters for Jidra in there. Otherwise, it's kind of fail upon creation. Remove those and um, we create the function. If Jidra already recognized the function, it will probably be named fun underscore the address where it's located at. That doesn't tell us much the original name does, we just rename the function instead. And then lastly, the type recovery. Uh, the search here is for different uh, through different sections and structures. Uh, once we encounter, encounter a structure, we do this recursively because one of the members of a structure might be yet another structure that we don't know about. Uh, but if it's, let's say, just integers, then we are very quickly done. Uh, there's caching in here as well. So if you have already recovered this, uh, then it should be faster uh, as you might encounter the reuse of certain structures. And we rename them uh, based on their name and we add a comment based on the types and the field name uh, of the structure. I did look into creating the structures automatically in Jira as well and then populating them. The downside here is that we often don't know what size certain fields are. So for an integer, we know based on the architecture how many bytes in size it is. But if we have, let's say, a RSA public key, uh, we should know. I picked the wrong example for cryptography because I don't know much about cryptography. But let's say you have a string. We don't know exactly what the length of that string is just based on that type. So uh, that is still work in progress. Maybe there will be an update. Maybe there won't. No promises, but I'm working on it. And then I just want to, this is what I uh, well, internally refer to as the startup slide because there's such a big difference uh, where now I'm selling you the world and maybe it's not uh, really worth it. But in this case, I want to uh, show the results of the Swift Slicer Wiper. And it's just one of the samples because it was recent, I picked it. And in here we, <laughs> we can see 0.05% uh, of the functions were known by Jira. But I do have to give a small preface here. So known functions by Jira uh, is what I refer to as a function that is not simply named after the address where it was found. Because Jira finds a lot more than 0.05% of the functions, but it doesn't name them to something that I find usable. However, after running the script, we have 98% of the functions covered uh, with a usable name. So there are still a few out there which are, well, unrecognized, weren't part of the PCLN tab. Uh, but this gives us a lot to work with just by waiting well, a brief period of time uh, and taking it from there. So the percentages are both calculated on the uh, highest number of functions that we know. So once we run the script, the function count increases because Jira missed some initially. So the 0.05% is based on the number of functions after the script has run. So don't mean this as hating, just as a comparison. And I figured some context was needed but I couldn't really find a graph to explain this other than me standing next to the graph. So live demo time. And I think, there we go, that should work. So what I first wanna do is, uh, oh, and there's actually a fifth script other than the fourth. Uh, I'm really proud of this. It took me a long, long time to come up with this script. Um, and this is, <laughs> This is a workaround that I uh, came up with because you have essentially three things in Jira. You have uh, loaders, analyzers, and scripts. 
and I might be cutting corners here, so don't be too harsh on this. But for the sake of explanation, uh, there are three things. So you have a loader, and the loader essentially tells you how to disassemble the given bytes that it receives. So in this case, this is an Intel-based uh, binary, and it will just uh, work with it uh, like that. So if I were to specify the loader for ARM, I would probably get some disassembly, but it would be complete garbage and therefore not bring me any results. So that's the loader. Then you have an analyzer and you can bring up the analyzers by pressing A or if you open a new binary, it will tell you, do you want to analyze this binary, which you generally want to. And you have several options. So each of these are uh, similar or well, different um they do different things, but they're all analyzers and you can check them or uncheck them. Uh, you could also say, uh, state that, okay, for the ASCII strings, uh, analyzer, uh, I want to have a minimal length or I have a different file or I do or don't require null termination for strings. Uh, so there's customization you can do, uh, at a very granular level here. But, uh, I mean, usually you just like use all run and then you go for a coffee break. So uh, that works generally. So those are analyzers. They're generally run at the beginning, but not necessarily always. So what you'll see if I do the function uh, recovery script, at the bottom side at the right hand, you'll see a progress bar moving, which is the analyzer for functions kicking in for each newly created function. Um, checking the stack, what primer parameters are used, can we infer parameter types based on the code in there or functions that call this function. Uh, so it's doing work behind the scenes automatically once we do this. And then we have the scripts where in this case I'm showing you the overview with only anything that filters on Golang, but there are a lot of scripts uh, readily provided but also created by the community. Now, the advantage of a script is that you can run it whenever you want. You could run no analyzers and then run your script, which might kick in some analyzers or maybe it doesn't. Um, but in this case, what I wanted to was uh, something that's very easy to use for the community. And for both the loader and the uh, analyzer, you would need to recompile the project and then install it in your GDRAW version. And they're version bound. So if I make one for, let's say, 10.1 and you're using 10.2, you will get the message this is not the correct version. You need to have the correct version. Even if there are no major changes or breaking changes or no changes at all, you need to recompile it after a version change. Now, I felt that, and I spoke to some people, this was a, a huge thing holding people back. Uh, if you have a full development set up, uh, then it's easy. But if you haven't, then it's not that trivial. So uh, I figured that scripts are compiled just anytime you hand them to Jira, it will just compile them and run them. Uh, so a script is the easiest and most portable way. They should work across versions based on the API functions that were used, based on the flat API, uh, which has backwards compatibility for, well, at least according to the documentation, forever. Um, so this is the, the easiest way to just publish this code online for everybody. And once it's online, you can just use it on, well, any GDRA version you are running. You're not bound to the specific version that I'm using. Now, if we are, and now I have to wonder if I'm in the correct part, uh, if we are in this sample, which is the Linux uh, ransomware, we can recover the functions. And we can see that it's running, and there at the bottom, you can see that some progress is being made. Uh, the console will contain the output with all the function names that are uh, being used and either renamed or created. And while this is running, I just want to have a brief look at the functions in a different file. So you just have to trust my words on this, that this is how it normally looks. Uh, you see that these are all named fun or thunk fun uh, for thunk functions. And there's not a lot I can get out of this uh, viewing this. I mean, I can spend a lot of time reversing it, but it would be a lot more helpful if functions were named as they are at the bottom. So in this case, for example, it says here fun underscore zero eight two blah 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 is renamed to main dot encrypt. Now this is telling me a lot already and it's gonna help me because this is this is what I enjoy, right? Finding either a binary with symbols uh or somehow regenerating those symbols uh is gonna help me a lot. Now as I said before, uh what you can do is you can click 
on an address and it will go there and you'll see that the disassembly and decompile view synchronize are synchronized and both go there and we can now see that we have a lot of these functions so we have crypto uh parse public key something so the arguments might still be wrong or kind of weird uh, but at least they're really helping you uh, along because otherwise these would just all be fun underscore something doesn't tell you much now in this case the overview looks a lot more usable as well we just have a lot of runtime related functions and knowing what they are is helpful but we don't necessarily care about their uh, internals especially not since we can either look up the go source code for those or just the description of them online uh, if we're wondering what something does now user code is uh, denoted by the main part at least the main dot main function is where you start uh, but in this case i want to get to the main dot get info function and then i just need to get the correct offset for my uh prepared list is that okay that works that's good now what we can see here on the and let me just put that a little bit more in the screen we have a move instruction that moves a specific value and then calls the runtime create new object so at least we know there's a object being created here but we're still not really sure what it is and the date that underscore means that it's a reference to the data uh, we can see some values in here and we see some cross references, uh, both in the get info function. Now, we don't know what it is, but uh, obviously we would like to know because this function is apparently gathering info. We know upfront it's malware, so it's generally sending, either doing some checks or sending something back to the criminal. And this is where it gets interesting. If I want to write detection rules, for example, what kind of stuff is it sending and how is it sending this are the questions that I would generally ask. Now, if we do the type recovery, we will see that this changes to a main.info object. And then if we were to open this, very kindly the script has provided us with a structure which tells us that there is a RSA public key string and a readme string uh, within this structure. So now I don't need to understand much more about the code, but we can see that by renaming it as well, we now have the creation of a new main.info object by the runtime. We can see some proxy related things going on. We have uh, HTTP transport client. So we know that there's some requests being made here. We know what kind of information they gathered or used. And we can see some runtime related stuff as well, right? The garbage collection barrier, for example. And we have in here a new uh, web request. Now, in terms of uh, strings, let me just go to this offset. Uh, what we can see here is that we have the load effective address of uh, this value into ECX. Then that value is put on the stack at offset uh, four. And uh, we can also see that another value is then put on the stack at the value eight. So this is the pattern of Jira putting, or Golang, I should say, uh, putting a string or creating a string. So it's getting the uh, the value, I mean, this is not really encrypted or encoded anything. You can, you can see what it is. This is the malware name. Um, and we also know that it's hexadecimally eight or just eight in decimal as well, uh, characters long. So we could obviously manually change this to like a character array of eight in size, but, uh, it might be easy in this case because it's really tedious if you do this on a scale. So, uh, and I think this should be a static one. And then we should see a change in the uh, decompiler as well. So it wasn't static. It should be dynamic then. And then we can see in here that this string is now S underscore the string value underscore the address it resides at. So this already tells us a lot more. Uh, information and we can see that in here in the decompiler it's now treated as a string and we can see its literal value um, compared to what we previously saw was just a reference to an address. Now to show you a bit more here, we do have sufficient time, that's good. Um, this is the Swift slicer 
uh, wiper. And in here, we see a function call to with several arguments. And uh, some of the arguments are not reachable, right? This is data offset four. So it's kind of probably not correctly decompiled. So if we were to look up into this assembly, we would see. But this one is where we get interested, right? The WNIC um, is, is what we uh, are kind of interested in, in generally, because this is interacting with the Windows operating system. Uh, the, the wiper is, I don't think it's uh, hidden anymore. It's a Windows uh, targeting wiper. Now, if we were to run uh, the script that I worked so tirelessly on to push four lines in, um, we can simply run all these four scripts in a row. Uh, it takes a bit of time, especially for the functions. It will do the renaming and it will help you. So keep in mind how uh, or how hard it is to really understand this part just on top of your head. Um, let's see, we're diving into this. It's barely break. I mean, it literally is uh, for you currently as well. So that's a nice, uh, you know, when you do this at, for work and it's barely break, you have the same feeling. And once we just wait for a little bit, we'll see the function names rename, and we see that the first argument turns into a string as well. Uh, and we can do this on a scale, obviously, because the whole process is automated, and you can run Jira headless if you want to. Uh, that is if you are a Jira user. Now, the original scripts were created uh, by Dorka, but didn't really have any documentation. So the variable names were kind of the documentation, which works, uh, but as this runs in the background, we are seeing at least some function changes, but let's just open uh, one of the scripts. Oh, I heard that. <laughs> there was some, uh, some silent judgment there. It wasn't too silent, actually. Uh, we'll let this one finish first. So what we can see currently is that we have the operating system functions and then it has the uh, execute uh, class and it has a command to execute. And lo and behold, soon this will at least be somewhat visible as to what it will execute. I kind of gave it away already up front. Now getting back to the documentation I'll show you in a second is uh, within the documentation of the new scripts, which will release uh, soon is that I really put a focus on the documentation. What I wanted to do is make it as easy as possible for people to edit and modify these scripts and also understand what's going on without having to dig deep into the Golang internals. If you are familiar with those, that's really gonna help you. If you are in the documentation should be clear enough to just help you get along and um, at least maybe update it or tweak it to your specific use case. Now, it seems like everything is finished. And as I knew this in front, I, I did my homework, but what a surprise. We now have the uh, command to execute uh, WIMC. And we know a lot more about this. So we have a loop where it walks through specific file paths. We now see that there uh, is a puncture, fu uh, function pointer uh, to another function, which is the walk function. And um, there we go. And we can see uh, some more interesting things that are happening. Now, you could even further utilize the renaming structure here. Uh, let's say you were to simply rename all functions and then export the function address as well as the name into a x64 debug script. You can load that and then you will have symbol function name symbols uh, during your debugging uh, in x64 debug. So you can use Jira either as like your main tool or as an intermediate uh, to do this. And you can script the whole thing without ever opening Jira as like a GUI because you can do this from the front end as well. So you can run these scripts and you'll probably want to run uh, the minimal version. Uh, if you're just interested in function names, that's the only one you're going to run to avoid additional waiting time. But what you can do is you can simply extract the function names and offsets, then load those into a script that's ready made for x64 debug uh, and you can do that all on your command line or for every new sample you get in for example depending on how many you get and how much storage you are willing to sacrifice for this idea but in general you can use this in a lot of ways um, that should be well applicable to quite some use cases depending on 
uh, where you are and what you work on. Now in here, uh, there is a lot of documentation that I added and I tried to use some constants as well. So uh, for the kind of type that it's trying to recover, there is a hard coded value within Golang. So hexadecimal 13 means the type is a function and hexadecimal 14 means it's an interface. Now, if we're just comparing values as in the original script where it said, well, if it's equal to hexadecimal 13, we do this, otherwise we do this, it gets kind of hard to read this. But if you were to select later on, like, oh, if the kind underscore function is equal to the value I have, it gets a lot more logical to follow. Now, at the bottom part, you see, should see the rendered uh, Java doc. Uh, which also contains hyperlinks to Golang source code or other relevant sources that I found during my research. And these should not be, uh, well, they should last over time uh, since linking the Golang uh, original source code is probably not going to go down sometime soon. So those are some global variables uh, I'm using. And for example, here we're looking for the Golang version and uh, you can add one additional if you want to. So let's say go uh, 1.21 comes out, you might add that. And there's also notes on how to read certain things. Whereas normally you would say 1.3 is greater than 1.21. It's not the case in Golang. The tip I would give you is ignore the one point something and just check the number behind it as if it were the only version number. Uh, that's going to save you a lot of time if you know that. That is... Uh, all I'm willing to disclose on that part. So uh, I focused on making it as easy as possible for you to work with this, making it as uh, documented as possible. I don't want to over document it where you have, well, I don't want to say more documentation because that's already the case than lines of code, but uh, I don't want you to have to sift through a whole book before you know it, but I also don't want you to sit there, look at the code and wonder what's really going on there. So that is the uh, the state of the scripts themselves. Uh, some additional information is sometimes included in regards to design choices or testing that I did based on, for example, the caching. I tried several data structures and added some explanation as to why I chose this specific data structure. Uh, obviously, improvements are welcome in any uh, way, shape, or form. So if you know a better structure or way to, let's say, cache the data than I've used, obviously, we can use that speed advantage. Well, that kind of gave away the surprise I had at the end. So it's time for Q&A. We have 12 minutes left, which is roughly what I counted on. If you have a question that arises after the talk and after the Q&A, uh, feel free to, hey, uh, if you see me on the conference, just tap me on my shoulder and uh, feel free to ask away. If you have any other questions, you can reach me on Twitter, Mastodon, or LinkedIn, uh, or if you know somebody who knows me, that might be a way to ask, but direct is always easier. Um, I just want to thank uh, Casey for sharing the uh, AI generated call for image with me last night. And uh, it's been of good use. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Max. <laughs> Questions? Uh, I would like to ask why go stores field names and such. I, I would guess for reflection purposes, but like for structures, I saw like uh, that you're able to not only reverse the structure of field types, but also the name. So if you don't use it for reflection, why are they stored in the binary? So based on what i read up on the discussions that were there i think the pc land tab in 2013 and uh there is a blog coming out at the same time when we release the code in well soon i don't know the precise date but um that also goes partially into this uh so the goal of this whole structure is to have a more efficient runtime when an error occurs it doesn't need to load and populate a table i'm not sure how precise, correct, that explanation is uh, given today's date, roughly 10 years later. Uh, but that was the original reason to implement the PC LAN tab in Golang, uh, because it was more efficient for the language itself. So they kind of cut the links during runtime. If you, uh, if the runtime itself needs it, 
and thereby provide crash reports, etc. that would allow you to see, oh, this is where it went wrong in my source code. Uh, so I think that's the, the origin and also the reason why they keep it in. Hello. Uh, good speak. Thank you. Um, I have a question for you. I think uh, uh, just to think forward in the future, you, you mentioned earlier that in some of the source code that you found out that Jira was dating back to as early as 99? Yes. Um, uh, just for yourself and forward thinking, where do you see um, like neural networks and machine learning coming in the future in terms of malware for writing and also for d finding? So uh, there are at least some links, bridges available to use this within Jira as of now. You would still have to create your own machine learning model. I mean, NSA is not going to provide you with that. They already provided you with the tool. Um, I might be a skeptic towards some of the parts of AI. I think some of the use cases are great. And maybe like 10 years I'll look at this talk and be like, oh, I was so wrong. Uh, who knows? That's the, the, the danger of predicting the future. So personally, I think that uh, AI is great for recognizing patterns and using those patterns. So let's say in uh, the medical field, uh, where maybe interpreting CT scans can be very much enhanced versus uh, human skill or beyond even what we can notice. We can only take in so many parameters when we think, and the computer can do a lot more than that. Whereas with malware-related things, from what I've seen thus far, it's not necessarily blowing me away what people can do having said that there are quite some evolutions going on uh, i think the most difficult part here is that you have humans trying to well, essentially battle humans uh, via the computer whereas uh, biology works the way it works if you have a, a a dot on a ct scan that might turn into a terminal disease um there's a we might not know it but there's very likely a logical reason for this sometimes it's a freak occurrence but maybe it's based on eating habits we don't know yet or something else. So there is a reason for this. And maybe if you have enough parameters, you can distill some of these things. But if I'm making malware, I'm actively trying to go around some of the measures in place uh, that are set up for defense, which I think is an inherent difference between the two applications. And I think the difficulty will be more so in the fact that humans are working against each other uh, when looking at malware compared to biology or medical uh, appliances where the virus is not changing because we're analyzing it there's not coming an update because we're analyzing it there might come an update as we've seen with viruses uh, if we become resistant to it or maybe there's a bio biological evolution but in a much different way than i see with malware but it's just my two cents on it. I'm mostly malware analyst, not a uh, AI. Uh, you spend a lot of time with it, so uh, it's like a, a value. <laughs> it's a valued opinion to have, you know. But thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering. Let's say if if I were after this talk, if I were a malware writer, uh, I would first thing I would do, I, I would update my malware. Overwriting the the table p what what is the name of the table PC Loader, tab. Yeah. overwriting and wiping it would that work or, or is it a stupid idea? Uh, I don't know. I've got this question Next. from multiple people, ah. but I was just focused on getting this done first. Uh, it could work. I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure how the runtime is interacting with the table. Let's say you were to fully zero it out. I'm not sure if the runtime is going to crash early or maybe nothing changes. I don't know. Uh, but if you were a malicious actor, I would say just write it in plain C, don't add obfuscation or encryption or anything. Just, I enjoy my weekends, right? <laughs> Anyone else? In your estimation, uh, how much of the malware out there is being written in, Go in Golang, and is there a tendency to go more Golang in the future, you think? So in terms of uh, estimating sizes, it's kind of hard because even if I were to pull in corporate telemetry, it's just what we see. I mean, we see our telemetry, but it's not equal to the entire global usage. Uh, that would also beg the question how much of the malware is generally detected and how much isn't. 
if you fly under the radar for years with like a huge amount of samples, you might skew the t- statistics to a certain extent. So uh, I find that first part hard to answer. But related uh, relation to is Golang on the rise, if you will. Uh, it has been. And um, what previously was the, the problem for a lot of analysts is if you encounter such a sample and you and it that end, then you either just need to rely on all oh, the sandboxes showing me this, which, uh, you know, I mean, in the case of the wipers, it's going to wipe your sandbox, right? That's a pretty straightforward case. Uh, but still remains the question, was there more to it? Is there, are there additional capabilities within the sample that are either not activated or maybe it could or couldn't reach the C2 and therefore it just wipes your device rather than functioning as a backdoor or maybe based on your username or in your, um, environment any names or um that it would for t- let's say it's really targeted malware uh so if it sees like laptop from max and uh, then it will become a backdoor and otherwise it will just wipe uh or just display no behavior at all uh the symbols can be quite tricky so the manual analysis was kind of the hard part um and now more and more tools are being developed in scripts uh to help you out in that point uh, so it's becoming more, but the analysis is becoming, oh, I don't want to say easy, but easier than it was. Uh, so it's on the rise, but if the tooling keeps up with the, <clears throat> with the progress, then that should be fine, I think. And just as a quick follow up to the, the other question there, and you don't have to disclose these, but are you aware of, um, anti analysis or obfusc- obfuscation techniques that malware authors could employ to, complicate your script or similar scripts f- from working mm, other than the one that was already mentioned but i'm not sure if that works uh i don't know what we often see is that malware is just packed and you don't necessarily care what language the packer or the target binary is written in if you just do let's say process injection uh, or you just make it really obfuscated uh, then the scripts might still work to recover some function names but let's say the obfuscation has already made them garbage from the get-go uh, in the original source or altered, right? Either of those. Uh, then sure, instead of fun underscore address, I now have a, 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 a as function names. Uh, it's not going to tell me much either. So I don't think there's anything special you have to do to, uh, well, give people a headache who analyze files, be it Golang, be it something else. Thank you. Okay. We have. Time for just one more question. Otherwise, we can just wrap it up and have lunch. Oh, there's one more. Someone is keeping you off. No lunch, lunch then. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is just merely hypothetical, and it's only because uh, the two other attendees have mentioned. So. Uh, Hypothetically, how realistic is it for malware to infect a GPU and then essentially cre- rewrite itself on the fly? As in use the GPU to... Yeah, like somehow uh, the malware has uh, compromised the GPU and then begins to rewrite itself like AI, essentially. I would say that just rewriting itself is... I haven't seen it often, but it's kind of a pain in the ass. Um, I don't think it will be a lot harder or easier if it uses, uh, I'm not sure what's the, the one from NVIDIA called, like Kudo or something. Yeah, just like, um, yeah, use the Kudo cause. Yeah, yeah. Cause um, it-, it will be, well, you need to dig into something new, but previously to the Hermetic Wiper, I hadn't really dug into the FAT32 and the NTFS file systems either. Uh, did lose some sleep, did get the analysis done. Kind of a trade-off that yeah. you generally yeah. see. Um, <laughs> it's the way life goes, I guess. But uh, I mean, in, in, in such a case, I think it's quite similar where they're using a new technique and then um, you, you need to find a way around it. And if it becomes too common, people will make a tool and publish it probably. So I don't think there is a necessarily inherent danger there. But uh, it's just, it's like um, we're on such a new like forefront now where we have to think of things that we never had to think of before. And I mean, it's exciting, but then it's also, uh, how far can your imagination go? And then also what is actually possible? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I guess we'll find out in the future. Yeah. <laughs> 
think it's the best answer I can give you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Max.